Hi, welcome to Learn from Leaderonomers. Today we are here at the Asian Mensa Gathering in Kuala Lumpur. We are here with Jerry Corey. He is the founder and managing director of Bufori. Thanks for coming, Jerry. It's a pleasure. Now, I understand that Bufori started in 1986 uh, as a hobby. You just decided to make your own car? Pretty much, yeah. Pretty and much. how did that transition into a business? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, historically, when Bufori first started, it was against the odds. You know. I came from a relatively well-to-do family and um, I was trained as a property developer and a carpenter by profession um, and just you know my passion for cars was you know, so strong and so I believed so much in what I wanted to do. Um, I took on a challenge that I wanted to build a car from nothing um, and uh, in no time at all you know I, I lost all my friends, I lost family, um, you know, my brother supported me, my wife and kids all supported me of course. Um, but. Essentially, the real problems, the, the, the real challenges for me were um, no one really believed that I could actually pull off this little stunt that I was trying to take uh, play on. Um, at the end of the day, when the car was completed, everyone wanted to be my friend again, everyone wanted to be a part of it, and um, my two brothers wanted a car each, and each time I'd attempt to build a car for them, somebody would buy it. And uh, 16 years later, they got their first cars. But, um, it's a long time. <laughs> it's a long time to wait. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, but the moral of the story is that you know I, I believed in what I was doing, and you know that's really what it was. Um, I never went back to the building industry again. Um, I stayed clear of it. Although I, you know I was always involved indirectly, but not directly. Um, focused 100% of my efforts on the dream that I had, and I'm still focused on the same dream. That's that's phenomenal. Yeah. And so during that transition period, you say you had you know different reactions, some people weren't supportive. Well, yeah, from the instant, you know, the moment yeah. I even thought of the idea, you know, people are already telling you why you can't do it, mm. you know, and just don't let that get to you, you know. Yeah, how do you not let that get to you? How do you know that this is this is the right road <laughs> to go down? Um, it's, it's something that's innate, I think, you know, it's not something that you can be told, you know, you can't just do it because you believe in it. You've got to believe in yourself first. Um, that's something that I do, you know. Um, I'm a leader by example. I never tell someone to do something if I can't do it myself. And that in itself told me that you know, if I believe I can do this, despite what all the odds are saying, um, I'm going to achieve what I'm out to achieve. And you know, if nothing else, um, I use it to my advantage. You know, it was a target that I'd set. Um, I've got to succeed just to be able to put everyone else in their place and prove to them that you know, if you do believe in dreams, you, know, you can make them happen. And I did exactly that. You know, and I, I literally had every odd imaginable against me, you know. Sure. Yeah. And I'm sure during that journey as well, there were sort of times when there were moments of failure, moments of disappointment. Can you name us just one, one particular Well, time? yeah, I mean, gosh, I almost went to jail because I made too much Goodness. noise. And, okay. you know, <laughs> I was, was right. Oh, I'm, I'm not literally going <laughs> okay, to jail. Okay. But, you know, the neighborhood was pretty upset with me. I'm driving a car that's not registered on public roads. And, you know, so. <laughs> but, yeah, you do experience some difficulties. Um, the, the, the biggest obstacle, really, was, and the failure, really, was disappointing people, you know, people that have believed so much in what I was supposed to be doing, um, who really thought that I'd lost the plot, you know, and that in itself, you know, that was probably the one primary thing that um, was the failure that I was out to make sure it doesn't happen, you know, if, if I can share it with you that way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there was, I mean, in the early days, there wasn't really that many other failures. Like I say, I came from a fairly well-to-do family and money wasn't an issue, so, you know, with money you can do whatever you like almost. But as time went by, it had to become a business. Um, we experienced lots of hardship, you know, especially in the transition coming to Malaysia, for example. Um, you know, we had a partnership issue, and uh, uh, we had uh, different objectives, you know, between the partners. Mm. Um, you know, so you know, and there's a lot of money involved, and everyone loses money, and when partnerships don't work, you know, people get hurt. Yeah. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we were victims in a partnership. You know, so you know, we experienced that. Even going through a transition from one country to another, mm. um, there's a lot of hardship in that. You know, yeah. you're a foreigner in this country, and um, from Australia to Malaysia, and you're always seen as a foreigner, no matter what. Um, and as you know, you, you can't please everybody, and it's very difficult for everyone to please you too. Um, but you've, you know, we've been in now for close to 18 years, so you know, mm. we've shown our resilience yeah. um, and commitment to what we're doing, and that's what we're doing. So we're still trying to go through it. You know, we still experience a lot of difficulties lots of them, um, but it, because our determination to succeed is so strong um, and so sincere, 
uh, you know, you just seem to find a way to put all those things behind you or you know, put them to the side or in the too hard basket and just focus on what you're here to do. Mm. But it's a challenge. Every day is a challenge, you know, especially for foreign companies in this country, sure. unfortunately. Yeah. What do you think it is about cars that gets some people? I mean, I can see when you talk about, you know, what you do and, and when I talk to some men and women, when you just mention cars, there's like a sparkle in their eyes. <laughs> but what do you think it is about cars? It's you know? communication, you know, to me, it's something that, you know, it appeals to everybody. Mm. Um, you know, it's not a biotechnological product. It's not something that we hear about but don't really know what it is, you know. A car is something that everybody in this day and age has to come in contact with. Um, and people have got a lot of pride in ownership, you know. A car is probably the second biggest investment in most people's lives ever. Um, in some cases, a car could actually be the biggest investment, you know. Cars are more important to some people than a home, for example. Mm. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, cars has been my life, you know, that's what I live my life for. Um, I love anything that's artistic, I love anything that's, you know, mechanical, I love, you know, I've got a very broad like for things in life, but as far as cars are concerned, as far as before is concerned, um, what I'm doing, to do what I'm doing, you've got to have serious money. Um, I can do the same thing that people in the industry do with 10, 20, 30 times more money than I'll ever have. So the only reason I'm able to be able to achieve what I'm doing and enjoy it so much um, is because I'm so passionate about what I do. And when you're passionate about something, you always find an alternative way to achieve the same thing that people can do if they had the financial resources to back them up. Um, I don't have the resources that the General Motors and the BMWs of the world have, mm. um, but I can do what they do. And the reason I can do it is by exercising passion. You're so determined to achieve the same goal or the same objectives, um, you always find an alternative way to do it. And that's what I do. That's how I live my life. Mm. Um, cars excites me because it's there's so much in a car. You know, it's there's so much mechanisms, so much mechanical activity going on. There's so much autom there's so much technical design. Um, you know, styling. You talk about styling. Um, it's as much about function. Before it is as much about function as it is about form. A car can't just look pretty on the outside. There's a lot of contemporary classic cars in the world. There's a lot of small handmade cars, boutique manufacturers, that produce beautiful looking cars, but do they really work? And I'm talking about really work, are they really durable, efficient, mm. dependable cars? Um, that's where before it differs from them. And we're able to make cars that not just look pretty, but these things are designed to function, they're designed to work, you know, they provide all the luxuries, they provide all the styling cues that are required or are demanded, um, they provide all the efficiencies, environmental efficiencies, safety efficiencies. Um, you know, production efficiencies, maintenance efficiencies, they're all there and they've all been instilled into our vehicles. And that's what excites me, that's what makes me tick, you know, it's mm -hmm. why I smile, why I enjoy what I do, you know, there's so much to a car. Yeah, and the passion translates into every detail. Into every single car. nut and bolt that goes right. into the vehicle. And, you know, we've got 5,000 items in a car and 5,000 items that we, that we make and these are made by hand and, you know, the, the, the standards that we have to comply to are second to none. Yeah. Incredible. So what do you say, Jerry, to someone who comes up to you and says, um, I don't know what my passion is? <laughs> how, I mean, yeah, yeah, how do you identify a passion? You can't rush into these sort of things. It's not something you can tell someone, go and become passionate about something. You're either passionate or you're not. Mm. Um, that's what I believe. And people may not find it today, but they'll find it tomorrow. You know, all you've got to do is focus on life, you know. I've got you know, some very talented workers in the factory and you know, it's an amazing um, process that we go through to get these people. People that come in to work for us, for example, I just share, I hope I'm not diversifying no, too much, no, no. but we have workers that come in who think they're mechanics, you know, and they'll come in and work as a mechanic and then they see what other people are doing and we rotate them throughout the entire company. And then we identify where their strengths and their weaknesses are. And you'd be amazed, most people end up in an area where they never thought they would even be able to consider in, you know, mm -hmm. prior, to this, prior to working for our company. But the point that I'm just trying to make is when you end up identifying where their strengths are, you identified it for them, they couldn't identify it for themselves. And you'd be amazed, given an opportunity, um, they can develop a passion for what they're actually doing. It's something new, something different. The monotony of what they've been doing in the past has all changed and gone. Um, and it gives them a chance, we've given them a chance to be able to find something new to do. And, uh, and that's what we do, you know, we give people an opportunity. Um, the unfortunate thing about Malaysia, or fortunate or unfortunate, how it depends on how you look at it, Malaysian workers are not 
technically trained like they are in developed countries to become tradesmen. So if I call two people to come and do a specific job, two people are going to do the same job totally differently. Sure. Whereas if I did this in the US or in Europe or in Australia, two people are going to ad address that same job exactly the same way. Yes. Now when you bring in Malaysian workers to do the same job, it's very different. Now we teach them different ways of doing things. We rotate them through a system and we identify their strengths and their weaknesses. And it's incredible, you know, the education process. Not only they're learning, but we also learn. Mm -hmm. You know, we give them the benefit of the doubt. We listen to their, the pros and cons. You know, sometimes you get a guy who'll come in and say, well, okay, I don't like the way you do it. I think my way is better. So we give him the chance and we let him do it his way. And then you, you come back and he'll end up either doing it your way or you're <laughs> going to change and do <laughs> it his way. But yeah. at the end of the day, you know, people's passion develops over time. It's not something you can flick a light switch and say, that's it, I'm going to become passionate about something. It doesn't work. It's something that has to be, you've got to have the opportunity first. Mm. And uh, once you've been given that opportunity and if you believe in what you're doing and if you're so determined, um, before it is an interesting case, you know, our whole company is passionate about everything. You know, my passion rubs off onto every single member of my company, and uh, which I think is a good thing. Um, and, uh, you know, they become more passionate about something that I even do, you know, and it could be the smallest things. It could be something really big and elaborate. Mm. Uh, so it's quite interesting. Yeah. Great. So, so really do what you're passionate about. And, and to find your passion, sometimes exposure yeah. to different things. Well, the way I look at helpful. it, the way I look at it is, if you don't know what your passion is, just find something to do that you like doing. Don't do mm -hmm. something for the sake of doing it. Um, I always tell my staff, don't do it because you have to do it because you want to. My brother has this old saying. He says, it doesn't matter what you do in life as long as you do it to the best of your ability. You know, you can sweep the streets, you can do whatever you like. It doesn't matter. Just do it to the best of your ability. And if you can be passionate about sweeping the streets. That's well and good, you know, that's really what it's about. Do it because you want to, not because you have to. If you're going to follow the money only, then forget about it. There's no mm. passion with money. Mm. You know, you can become passionate first, the money will come later. You know, you can't think about the monetary side of it first and uh, expect it all to come from that. It's not passionate then, it's become purely commercial. Uh, final question, Jerry. Uh, if you were a car, what would your exterior look like? <laughs> I think if everyone says if you were to cut me, cars or motor oil comes out of my blood. Um, so I'm pretty close to the question. Um, what would I look like? Yeah, I believe in contemporary classic design. You know, um, don't judge a book by its cover. It might look classical on the outside, but it's incredibly talented, Boy. incredibly modern, mm. incredibly sophisticated underneath that surface. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of hidden talent. And that's something that, you know, Jerry Curry is all about, you know. So if I was a car, that's what I would most certainly be. <laughs> you know, a contemporary classic, yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for your time today, Jerry. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. So that's today from Learn from Leaderonomers. Thank you for your time. See you later.